Hello, I'm Alexandra Darcy and I'm the Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria. I'm an uninvited guest on these beautiful territories where I work, live, and play. And so I acknowledge the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Wasainich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. It's my genuine pleasure today to introduce Dr. Charlotta Chalier, Professor and Chair of Germanic and Slavic Studies here at the University of Victoria. Dr. Chalier's training, undertaken at the University of British Columbia, grounds her squarely in history, Germanic studies, cultural studies, literary studies, and media studies. A journalist before returning to the academy to complete her studies, she once nurtured a dream to become a filmmaker. These intersecting, overlapping, and interdisciplinary interests, skills, and expertise are fully on display in the work Dr. Chalier presents today, where she deftly and gracefully il illustrates the ways in which art, visual storytelling, and oral history come together to express the voices of trauma. There is a tender beauty in the graphic narratives that Dr. Chalier's research team comprising artists, survivors, archivists, and academics have composed. They record terrible truths alongside powerful tales of love, of loss, of endurance, and ultimately of the inimitable human spirit. Dr. Chalier is a nationally and internationally recognized expert on Jewish identity in contemporary cultural discourse, the Holocaust, and human rights education. She's funded by agencies both here in Canada and in Europe through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Erasmus and Jean Monnet Network, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and the Zurich Department of Culture, among others. She is the winner of the 2018 Faculty of Humanities Award for Excellence in Teaching and the 2019 University of Victoria Reach Award for Excellence in Knowledge Mobilization. Her presentation today but I live, will transform you. It is humanities research and community-engaged participatory research at its finest. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for this very nice introduction, very kind introduction, and it's a pleasure for me to be here and talk to you about our project that's on visual storytelling in Holocaust and human rights education. I also like to thank the faculty of Humanities, who has been sponsoring and, and supporting this project. Now, today I would like to talk to you about our research project that we initiated two years ago, and it brings in a lot of community partners, scholars from, from many countries, but it really is about one specific relationship only, and that's a relationship between a child survivor of the Holocaust and between an artist. And this project, regardless of how many people and scholars and community partners are involved, this project is about the power and the impact of one single story. A story that talks about trauma, um, extreme instances of human suffering, instances also of recovery and resilience in the aftermath of, of genocide. However, a story by itself is not necessarily accessible. A story by itself might be in an archive, might be somewhere in a book, it might be lost. And here I think our project is relevant and comes in because we, through the pen and through the eyes and the heart and the soul of an artist, we're going to bring the story alive. And that's really at the heart of our project. It is the story is only visible, accessible, is listened to if it is being heard, if it's being represented. So. My presentation today will tell you about this very close and intimate relationship between an artist and a an Holocaust survivor. So I'll talk today about the social justice work of graphic novels, about what it takes to bring together visual artists and Holocaust survivors, and how our project works. Then I'll tell you about learning about and for human rights and Holocaust education, why it's absolutely pivotal and important to apply a human rights framework to the teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Then I'll tell you about 
uh, with theoretical and methodological framework in introducing new arts-based pathways for engaging with survivor testimony. And the core of this presentation is about Barbara Yelin. She's one of our graphic novelists. And we'll introduce her, we'll talk about her storyboard techniques, and we'll talk about her work with Emmy Arbel, who is a Dutch Holocaust survivor born in The Hague and lives now in Israel. And we'll wrap up the presentation with, with a discussion or a talk, because you're not participating, unfortunately, about how sites of traumatic history and memory can be transformed into the visual storytelling medium. So first of all, a project like this has many, many partners. Even though I stand here and represent it, I'm just a little, a little participating, a small voice. So we were able to um, get a broad array of community support from Germany, uh, from Holland, from the UK, from Canada, and from Israel. And you see some of our partners being listed there, the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, the Adelson Archive in Germany, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and others. So right now we find ourselves at a very critical juncture in Holocaust uh, education. We have so very few survivors left with us. All of them are child survivors, and all of them are, are an advanced age. So in Holocaust education, a big question is how do we ensure that the memory is not lost, that we continue to capture and teach their stories, and what do we do once we enter a post-witnessing world. Also, the recent surge of nationalist right-wing threats to democracy, xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism across the globe compels us to foster new pathways of interdisciplinary and community-engaged dialogue in human rights-focused Holocaust teaching and learning. Below you see one of the storyboard panels from Miriam Libicki, who worked together with uh, Vancouver-based Holocaust survivor, survivor David Schaffer. And the title of her story is, If We Had Followed the Rules, I Wouldn't Be Here. Now, as part of our project, our goals are set as follows. We develop a new dialogical reflective pedagogy in Holocaust and human rights education. What we mean is that we are not just presenting the story, but we also give, provide to our learners the toolkit, the understanding to critically engage, not just with the history, but also with the memory and with the commemoration of history. Now we foster broad and deep collaborations and intercultural exchange between visual artists, survivors, human rights educators, scholars, students, and community members in Canada, Germany, Israel, the Netherlands, and the UK. Again, it is very important as a team that we work together. For example, right now in, in, during COVID-19 times, we meet on, on Zoom. Uh, we have artist cafes where we bring the, the artists together with the survivor. So it's of critical importance that we do not work in small research silos, but we actually, even in this very, very challenging time, we connect with one another. Then another goal is to design, design impactful teaching resources that integrate learning about the Shoah into broader questions of human rights uh, protection and civic education. Here we have a team of dedicated educators that make sure that all the teaching resources are going to be available on a digital platform. Now what does learning about and for human rights in Holocaust education entail? Learning about and for human rights in Holocaust education contributes to a critical engagement with social justice. It teaches students to respect and defend, and I'm quoting Hannah Arendt, the right to have rights. The Shoah is a central part in the Israeli high school history curriculum. However, there is almost no direct link between the instruction of the Holocaust and human rights as a subject. Now, in Germany, the situation is similar. Germany, of course, has an extensive Holocaust education curriculum, yet only few teacher training programs offer graduate seminars in Holocaust learning and human rights education. Here, by the way, you see a, a beautiful drawing by Barbara Yelin from her award-winning award graphic novel, Irmina. In Canada, we are still in the early stages of developing joint initiatives between universities, Holocaust practitioners, and human rights groups. When we started to conceptualize our own project, 
we drew on some projects that have been very successful in bringing us graphic arts based educational models for broader human rights centered Holocaust learning and teaching. And here I'm just mentioning two. One is the, um, an exhibition at the Caserna Dossa in Belgium and another one is from an amazing project called Redrawing, Redrawing Stories from the Past. Now I'd like to introduce the three award-winning graphic novelists um, to you who are part of our project. They are based in Munich, Germany. That's Barbara Yelin, Vancouver, BC, Miriam Libicki, and Jerusalem, Israel. It's Gilad Selektars. All three of them work not just in close collaboration with the survivors, but also with the entire research team. So we have been asking a lot from them, not just um, have we asked them to co-develop a, a graphic novel over a sustained time, uh, a sustained period of time, but we also have to ask them to deal with historians, with human rights scholars and community partners. So they have been amazing to work with. So these works will be accompanied by teacher's guides and instructional materials in several languages, Arabic, English, French, German, and Hebrew. Individual lesson plans will be adapted to culturally specific learning environments and learning standards in the countries of our participating partners. And you see an image of Emmy R. Bell, who was born 1937 in Holland. David Schaffer, who now lives, lives in Vancouver. He was born in Romania. And Rolf and Nico Kamp, these are two uh, brothers uh, who survived the Holocaust in, in Holland in 13 different hiding places, originally from Krefeld, Germany. We were very fortunate to have secured the publishing rights of two publishers, one in Toronto, the New Jewish Press, and Seha Beck in Germany, who will be releasing um, our graphic novels in 2022. The teaching materials will be made digitally available on an open source educational platform so that middle school and high school teachers do have access to the materials. Now, why is visual, visual storytelling so impactful and powerful? We contend that it is especially effective for life stories and memories of child survivors as they recall their memories in a vivid associative context, which intuitively lends itself to visual representation. And what you see here is a drawing by, by our Israeli artist Gilad Selektar, 13 Secrets. So this particular story details the surviving story of Nico and Rolf Kamp, who were hiding in 13 different places in Holland, in the Dutch countryside. Images are much more deeply imprinted in a child survivor's memory. Local Holocaust survivor Julius Maslowat eloquently described it to me. He said, the image is the language. And what we often see with child survivors, that they have um, specific recall of scenes, of fragmented, of very fragmented memory. And it is here that a graphic novelist can really bring this fully to life. Now, in the last two decades, graphic novels have become a major area of research in literary literacy and curriculum studies. And here I just lift list several studies that explore how graphic novels encourage students to be mindful of multiple perspectives and contribute to the development of historical thinking skills in history, social justice, and human rights education. When I originally conceived my project, I had a few skeptical scholars, mostly historians, who said, graphic novels, are you sure this is appropriate? And I said, yes, it is. Because the moment you start working with these texts, specifically texts like Mouse, you see how, how complicated and complex their own storytelling methodology is. So graphic novels allow us to really look at the layered, layered fragments of memory, not just at history, but of the issues of memory recall, at the is issues of, of testimony giving. They are just an incredible, important and impactful um, medium. Now, graphic novels, do we really know what we talk about when we talk about graphic novels? It often leads to confusion because how does it um, differ from comics, from narratives? And here I found um, an, uh, 
dictionary entry that I think is very useful. So a book-length narrative in comic strip form is normally called the graphic novel. The genre has been known by other names such as picture novel and comic strip novel, but graphic novel, a term first found in the 1960s, has more often been adopted since the 1980s. Now, the graphic novel attained literary recognition in the later 20th century, especially, of course, with Arch Spiegelman's Holocaust narrative, Mouse. Now, even though Oxford just claimed it was a genre, it really isn't. And he, a graphic novel, even though it's called a novel, is a format. So graphic novels can be fiction, non-fiction, history, fantasy, or anything in between. And this, of course, is specifically relevant when we talk about graphic novels of the Holocaust, because our, our production of graphic novels, of course, is based on actual testimony given by survivors. So graphic novels are similar to comic books because they use sequential art to tell a story. Unlike comic books, however, graphic novels are generally stand-alone stories with more complex plots. So let's go to our first um, case study, if I may call it such, uh, such a way. So that's Miriam Libicki and David Schaffer, who met in January 2020 in Vancouver, and you see this was pre-COVID. And so, how does our testimony inquiry process actually work? And, and, and here I want to tell you a little bit more about my experiences. So I have collected a series of, of, of testimonies mostly with Hungarian survivors of the Holocaust who have been saved by a, a letter of protection by Swiss Vice Consul Karl Lutz in Budapest in, in 1944. Now, I conducted very traditional uh, testimonies and, um, and I often felt that I got at the story but not quite. And then often I ended up talking to children, to family members, and I, and I felt I should have really consulted many more people to get a clear sense of, of this story or get a larger sense. And often it involved a lot of participating partners to actually get the story. And sometimes the survivor remembered the story differently. They sent me email and said, you know, I really like to include this part. And I said, no problem. And so I understood that the testimony collection process is so much more complex, time involved, and also involved so many more people than just me actually standing or sitting opposite a survivor and spending an hour and a half and collecting the story. So this was for me the first impetus to think of trying to do it a little bit differently. So institutional practices of producing, archiving, and exhibiting first-hand testimonies are mediated by highly structured, regulated, and standardized interview protocols. And they oftentimes, not always, but very often limit the possibilities of creatively engaging with survivor witnesses. So we do even speak of a testimony genre now. Conventional testimony interview protocols often limit our research practice and discourage us from interrogating our own research methodology and inherent disciplinary bias. I think this is a very important point. I'll talk about it more later. Now, the rigid formality of conventional testimonial practices fails to challenge the power imbalance between the interviewer and the interviewee. Then very often, it is the interviewer that keeps asking questions and often the interviewer, myself included, did not necessarily understand how implicated I myself was. And it really depended on how I asked the question, how I didn't ask the question, how I set up the interview, and all of these components are of critical importance. And I think in our project, because of the central importance and role of the graphic novelist, the, the artist is always center stage together with the survivor. So the genre of video testimony is in some ways monologic in nature. As the quote I'm quoting here, uh, Henry Greenspan, who has done incredibly important work on this, quote, the interpersonal center of gravity is almost always represented in the survivor, not in the relationship between the survivor and the interviewer, a convention which may itself misrepresent or at least obscure the dialogic processes through which testimony is usually constructed. So I would argue, and as do many other scholars, that a testimony 
is a result of a dialogical process. We know ourselves that we tell stories differently to different people. So it's never the same story. And this dialogical reflection and exchange is really at the heart of a testimony. And I would maintain that a very traditional testimony format where, where you have the camera set on the survivor, the eyewitness, will actually not do full justice to this whole complex um, encounter that is happening between the survivor, family members, um, community members, and the scholar. And that's one aspect that we very much try to get at in our research. So what do we do? What do we claim to do in our new arts-based approach? We approach witness survivor testimony beyond a regimented set of interview protocols. We conceptualize arts-based testimony inquiries as interactive, reciprocal processes committing ourselves to self-reflexively examine our own research practices. Adhering to the concept of shared authority, we are mindful to engage with survivors as partners in research and not as objects of research. And this really is very critical. When I was conducting research in a little bit more traditional format, I oftentimes felt that I was extracting the information, that I was parachuting myself into the scene, collecting information and leaving again after a couple of hours. And that's always something that, that very much bothered me. And, and I think this project or my own impetus or, to, or my own mandate in this project is to have a much more sustained, collaborative and, and long-standing relationship with the survivor. So here's another quote by Henry Greenspan, who really has become my mentor. He describes this joint knowledge production process as knowing with survivors as compared with only knowing from or about them. And this is really a critical, important aspect of, of our project. So, I've asked the, the graphic artists to really put themselves into the, into the drawing. Now, we told them upfront that we're not interfering in the process whatsoever. So we're not telling them what to do. We're not telling them what to illustrate. It is really their project in consultation, in partnership with the survivor. But I did encourage them to mindfully reflect on their own positionality. And here you see on the left, Gilad Selecta is in conversation with Rolf Kamp, and on the right, he's in conversation with Nico Kamp. And that was um, last year, or the year, no, I have to think, the year before 2019 in December in Amsterdam, where we had a film crew set it up and filming the whole interaction as well. But now I want to talk to you about a, a very remarkable and an extraordinary relationship. And that's, that's the one between Barbara Yelin, who is based in, in Munich, and Amy Arbel, who lives in a town nearby Haifa, Israel. And at the end of this presentation, you'll be seeing a nine or 10 minute clip that will document how Barbara and e and Emmy work together, but it will specifically shed light on Barbara Yelin's creative process. And you can see that below is uh, two panels from the, the storyboard. I think that already, uh, already very, uh, very summarized a little bit how this, how this relationship uh, works. So Barbara asks, what do you think? Aha, says Emmy. I don't like to look at myself in a picture. But it will be a graphic novel. It will contain images of you, many images. Oh yeah, I know. So what is really unique and special about the relationship that, that the survivors have, have a voice. And it's not just a voice that is represented. They really co-produce this piece of work. Now, a few words about Amy Arbel. She was born on November 17, 1937 in The Hague in Holland. In 1944, Amy and her family uh, were deported to the Ravensbrück women's concentration camp in Germany. Amy, her mother and brother are transferred later on to Bergen-Belsen in March 1945. One week after liberation, Amy's mother uh, passes away of exhaustion and Amy uh, is, is is there, is, is present, and that's, that's a major component of the graphic novel as well. Now, in 1948, Emmy 
Arbel emigrates to Israel. She has three daughters. Today she volunteers to support the children of Palestinian families from the West Bank. So when I talk to Barbara Yelin about the process of drawing very difficult, very heartbreaking, moving, traumatic memory, she explained it to me, and she explained what it means to actually draw memory. And, and here are some quotes from the film. She says, how do I draw the memories of the child Emmy? Memory is not fixed. It's a flowing, changeable fabric. Emmy often says, I don't remember. So very often times in this graphic novel, it is about, I don't remember. And how do we remember what is not accessible anymore? So Amy says, I can picture the things that happened to me, but I no longer remember exactly when and in which camp they occurred. I remember hunger, cold, blows. Death was very familiar to us. We encountered it every day. And you see here another panel from, from the storyboard. I don't remember. And oftentimes, as scholars, I think we have a tendency to push and we want to know, and we want to know more. And, and what the artist here does, she doesn't push Emmy, she just lets it be. So she gives space, room, color to this emptiness, to this non-memory non in many ways that is so present and that is so powerful and imp impactful. So Barbara Yelin says, drawing for me is an investigative tool. When I draw, each stroke is a decision, and every line poses new questions. How can a child be? How can a child exist in these circumstances? I'm drawing scenes in which she, Emmy, is remembering today what was happening at that time, after waking up at the movies, in a coffee, coffee shop, while looking in the mirror. And here I'd like to thank Ian Higgins for, for translating this text so ex exquisitely. When I talked to Barbara, that I always was fascinated in her own approach. And, and I always love watching her developing a storyboard, because the storyboard in itself is, as she says it so eloquently, an investigative tool. It takes her, it is, it is a process itself as she draws. And it, it's like writers write in order to understand and make sense of the world. Barbara draws in order to give meaning and make sense if there is such a thing of this story. Now here I'm showing you uh, some further panels and you can see how incredibly powerful they are. Now I should say that, that Barbara very, very frequently consults with Emmy and Emmy will give feedback. And oftentimes, then the feedback, of course, will be reflected in the drawings. I remember there was a discussion about the colors of the headscarves, so they were changed from, from white to blue. But you also see the importance of the color blue, that there was a decision Barbara took in consultation also with Emmy Arbel. And here Barbara reflects on what happens when the past actually collides, as she says so well, with, with the present. Memory has no chronological order. What Emmy recalls, though, appears next to the dark passages all the more impressive, stark, meaningful. Separate strands are braided into a single weave of images. Some panels throughout remain black. Some memory is blank is black. And this is a very important part you often see in this graphic novel, and you will see it in the film that follows my presentation very often. The panel itself, the frame itself, remains black because there's no memory, there's absolutely no recall. And here we have the, the, really the, how the graphic novel medium becomes so effective in showing this, this medium. Because oftentimes in a more conventional testimony collection format, we would just edit and move on. But here we actually stay with it. We stay with this very uncomfortable feeling of not knowing. We stay with that moment where we know we can never get back. We stay also with a moment that is ultimately very fluid because memory is never the same.
So here was a situation when, when in the storyboard there's just text but no image. So that was uh, after the war, 1945, when the war was over. Amy talks, I don't remember how they took us and brought us to Sweden. I know it was with a boat. I know things, but I don't remember. I came to the Kinderheim and later to the hospital. I had TBC. Now here you see another sequence where you, where you see how, how this collision between the present and the past is taking place. So here Barbara beautifully shows us how, how there's some memory fragments, some images that still come to mind for Emmy, but ultimately are gone and ultimately are lost. Here again, that's from the storyboard, page 8, and on the left you have an earlier version, and on the right is the one as it is right now. Is it still a storyboard, so I don't know if this will be the final version in the graphic narrative. But I remember Barbara thinking for very long to leave the blanks, just the coloration, the darkness, the, the black, and then in the end the decision was made to give it shape, to give it um, a story, to actually um, develop more of a narrative around that. But again, it is what Barbara calls drawing memory. It's a process, and it's a process I really want to emphasize that involves the survivor. So I know that Emmy checks in with Barbara, uh, and, and Emmy sometimes doesn't like it, and then there is a conversation, and some, sometimes there is a disagreement, and this is all part of this, it, this process both really jointly conceive and develop this story together. Here's another panel, that's page nine. You can see also on the left is an earlier version of that panel, and then now it's, it's more fully developed. But I'm not entirely sure if it remains on the right or if it will go back to, to the left. But uh, this scene also, this is the panel that you will see in the film accompanying this presentation later on where Barbara draws it. So this is um, Ravensbrück. So Barbara writes, Amy's childhood is connected with each and every today. This past has not ended. The long arms of history wrap, wrap right around the present, across generations, up to today, for surviving is not over, surviving is every day. And particularly this graphic novel very much so and very deeply engages with that process of what it means to live with these memories, what it means to carry on. And, and what she does very brilliantly is give a very full picture of Emmy and keep showing though that, that what what happened is not something that we kind of put away into an archive. What happened still resonates with us and is deeply impactful in our current world as well. So this is, a, this is how I like to end this presentation. Amy Arbel saying in one panel, the fact is I am still alive. And here you see two panels that show Barbara and Emmy going for a walk, talking with one another. And in the graphic novel, you often see these juxtaposing narratives huh? between having a conversation right now, then moving back into the memory and coming back. So I think the fluidity of the memory, but also the traumatic after effects of this history are, are very, very, um, very deeply represented and very meaningfully represented in this in this gra graphic novel. Because this is a community engaged research project, we felt it was very important to document the process as well. So not just to have the final graphic narratives in print, but also show learners how this this relationship, this beautiful relationship between the survivor and the artist actually came about. So we produced three films, film clips, that we like to show you now at the end as well. Now you'll see one with Barbara and Emmy, 
Um, but you also see one with um, Miriam Libicki and David Schaffer that was done in cooperation in partnership with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center and Gilead Selecta meeting Nico and Rolf Kamp in December 2019. That film was done in production together and with in partnership with the Anna Frank House in Amsterdam. I like to end on this note with this presentation and unfortunately I don't have the opportunity and possibility to engage with audience member, which I always think is such an important part um, because uh, the questions that you're asking, that you're raising really inform our research project. And so I'd like to give you my uh, email email address. So please contact me with, with any for, uh, questions. We also have a website, which unfortunately I did not put here, but I'll make sure that, that it's being listed where you see updates of the project. And we would be very grateful if you could follow us. And, and we apply now, right now, we are in an application stage for additional funding. What we also do, what we feel is very important is that we provide toolkits for this kind of research that we do. So if, if other scholars, community partners would like to um, conceptualize similar projects, we'd like to share our experiences with you. We have rich data, we collected a lot of information on the interview process, on our collaboration with one another. And, and we look very much forward to make this data available and sharing it with you as well. So I wanna thank you for your attention and, and for your time that you spend with our project. But most of all, I really wanna thank our artists and our survivors. And I become very emotional, even though I always say I teach it. Never, never teach it with any emotionality, but I become very emotional if, if I see that incredible work. And it has been transformative for me as a scholar. It has made a huge impact in my own life. When I started teaching the Holocaust, it was at one point that I almost reached a breaking point. I just couldn't do it anymore. I felt I was exposing my students to extreme images of atrocity and human suffering. And I think for me, bringing in the creative arts, bringing in artists who are so sensitive, who are, who are so extraordinarily mindful and careful and attentive to these stories and, and produce works like this has really changed my own approach, my own understanding in Holocaust and human rights education. So it's been a privilege for me and an honor for me to work with, with my partners and with, with the artists and survivors. So I'm the lucky one. So thank you again for, for your time.